Dr. Larry Dean, the director of the University of Washington Regional Heart Center. I'd like to welcome all of you to our grand rounds this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Steve Kramer, in the Department of Neurology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Kramer. I want to present the case today of a 39-year-old male who had two episodes of transient neurologic events. The first was four years ago, at which time he was unable to hold on to a sandwich due to left arm numbness and weakness. So during his lunch break, the sandwich was completed, symptoms lasted only 30 minutes, no evaluation was performed. Six months uh, prior to my seeing him, he again noted left facial numbness and drooping with left arm and left leg weakness and slurred speech. His symptoms lasted approximately 24 hours and he was seen at an outside hospital. At that time, he was diagnosed with mild hypertension and history of heavy alcohol use was noted with at least six beers per day. On review of systems, it was noted that he did have occasional brief palpitations and had some decrement in his memory function. At that time, the outside hospital started him on warfarin, losartan, and atorvastatin. Now, when I saw him a couple of months after the stroke, um, he, uh, I found him to be mildly overweight at about 238 pounds. His blood pressure and his pulse were unremarkable. He had a normal cardiac exam, and there were no vascular bruises present. On neurologic exam, he had mild left hyperreflexia and dysmetria, otherwise unremarkable, so only mild persistent sequelae of his neurologic insult. When I reviewed his MRI that had been done a couple months earlier at the outside hospital, I observed a 10 millimeter right posterior putaminal infarct that extended into the, into the white matter a little bit. And I thought that was consistent with either a small artery stroke or lacune versus an embolus to the right anterior choroidal artery. Workup at that time had already included normal carotid Doppler studies and a normal EKG. The outside hospital had also performed a hypercoagulability evaluation, which was unremarkable, as shown here. Among the first things I did in trying to understand the genesis of his stroke was refer the patient for a transesophageal echocardiogram to look for cardiac pathology, sources of embolus, as well as patent foramen ovale. Now, stroke is big business in America. It's the number three killer. It's the number two killer of humans across the world. It is the number one cause of adult disability in the US, Japan, Germany, Canada, and most Western countries. There's somewhere on the order of a million symptomatic strokes per year and an untold number of asymptomatic strokes each year in the US alone. When we divide these up, somewhere around 15, 20% are hemorrhagic a bleed inside the brain, a bleed on the surface of the brain. And the vast majority are ischemic or dry strokes due to occlusion of a vessel. Downstream from the occlusion, the brain is strangled, becomes ischemic with low flow, and dies. And that's an infarct or a stroke. This can be due to a large vessel process, such as a carotid occlusion. This can be due to a small artery process, such as a lacune, as we call these small deep strokes. Many are due to an embolus which is when material such as a clot break off from somewhere, such as the heart, and fly up and block the brain. I call this brain as a victim kind of stroke. Problem is, in somewhere in the order of 30 to 40 percent of strokes, they are what we call cryptogenic, meaning despite the very best of evaluation, we have no clue as to what happened, apart from the fact that, yes, indeed, a stroke occurred. Note that one quarter of all strokes are in people under 65 years old. So people try to understand what causes cryptogenic stroke. A number of theories have been advanced. One of the most important findings that multiple studies have observed is that patients with cryptogenic stroke have an increased prevalence of a small hole in the heart, or a patent foramen ovale, a small hole. When a clot passes from the venous side of the body through such a hole into the arterial side of the body, that is a paradoxical embolism. This is a brief summary of a subset of studies which show how the uh, PFO, the small hole in the heart, 
is overrepresented in patients who have a cryptogenic stroke, especially when they're younger. And if you look at the bottom line in yellow, you can see that about 46% from these studies of patients with cryptogenic stroke, 46%, nearly half, had a PFO, compared to normal controls where the value is 11%. So there's somewhere around four times as many of these holes, suggesting that they're somehow involved in the genesis of the strokes. In terms of some of the research, I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Goldberg. Thank you very much, Dr. Kramer. I'd like to uh, show you the transesophageal echocardiogram from our patient here. And uh, this is the uh, image of the transesophageal echocardiogram demonstrating uh, the left atrium here, the right atrium here, and here is the atrial septum. You can see a few bubbles uh, from the uh, patient's uh, IV. And uh, you might notice that there is a bit of a gap uh, in the atrial septum between the right atrium and uh, the left atrium, and this is the foramen ovale. When a intense uh, bubble contrast uh, is injected into the vein, you can see that at a certain moment when the uh, pressure rises inside the right atrium due to a cough, valsalva, or other thing, that the septum deviates over to, towards the uh, left atrium and at that moment, we can see bubbles going across this foramen ovale uh, and into the uh, left atrium, consistent with uh, patency of this foramen ovale. Notice also that uh, the septum is uh, bowing uh, fairly significantly, and this is consistent with an atrial septal aneurysm. And there has been several studies which have suggested that patients with a PFO and an atrial septal aneurysm such as this are particularly prone to the development of a stroke. Now, the fact that uh, a, a PFO uh, and paradoxical embolism can cause a stroke is no more strikingly uh, demonstrated than when a patient under, uh, during the throes of a uh, stroke has a transesophageal echo performed, and the thrombus occasionally can be seen actually present uh, going from the right atrium through the PFO into the left atrium. And I think that uh, this is uh, proof of concept that this can develop a significant embolic event. Well, we've talked about the clinical implications of a PFO. Uh, leading to a cryptogenic stroke or other embolic events, including uh, embolisms to spleens, kidneys, uh, retina, and other uh, parts of the body. In addition, this has uh, been associated with uh, decompression sickness or the bends, and a particular type of bends where the individual, after their scuba diving, uh, comes up and has a neurologic event. Uh, this has been uh, well associated with a, a PFO. Uh, in addition, uh, this type of bends has been seen with high-altitude aviationists as well as astronauts because of the decompression changes that occurs in those situations as well. There is a rare condition called platypnea orthodeoxia where an individual has shunting from right to left uh, across this PFO constantly, and this causes hypoxemia. This occurs in individuals who have uh, baseline lung disease, possible lung uh, resection, uh, and is a cause of uh, persistent uh, hypoxemia due to this shunting. And finally, there may be an association with uh, migraines. Uh, it has been uh, finding that occasionally patients who have had these uh, PFOs closed for other reasons, that their migraines have improved. And uh, whether or not this is a true finding or uh, just a chance uh, observation uh, is still under investigation. Well, once again, here's the transesophageal echo of our uh, patient showing not only the uh, uh, septal aneurysm, but I want to point uh, attention to the PFO itself. <coughs> A PFO is frequently not a true hole, but it is a tunnel. And the development, the reason that a PFO exists is failure of fusion of the septum primum and the septum secundum to come together. It's not a de otherwise a developmental abnormality, but uh, this lack of fusion sometimes can develop into a tunnel effect right here. Dr. Kramer talked about paradoxical embolism being when a thrombus develops in a vein and passes through this uh, patent foramen ovale. 
Lately, people have been speculating that the thrombus may actually form in situ, that is, within this tunnel of the PFO, and uh, that may be the uh, source of the uh, embolism to the brain. Well, because an embolic event through a PFO is felt to be uh, due to thrombus and has been observed to be due to thrombus, strategies to treat this logically can be directed towards antithrombotic therapy. And that has been the traditional uh, treatment for a cryptogenic stroke using uh, warfarin therapy. Now, whether or not warfarin is necessary or antiplatelet therapy with aspirin or other antiplatelet agents is sufficient is something that uh, is uh, being investigated. It also makes uh, logical sense to try and close this PFO to prevent the thrombus from either developing within it or traversing it. And this has been done both surgically and more recently using percutaneous techniques. Our patient underwent percutaneous closure of his PFO with this device, which is the CardioSeal device. Uh, this is a device which was approved by the FDA about a year ago. We've been uh, using this particular device here, which uh, consists of a double umbrella structure with a metal frame and a polyester fabric which sandwiches the uh, atrial septum. Another device which has been uh, approved under an HDE or humanitarian device exemption by the FDA uh, more recently is this Amplatzer device. This consists of two nitinol discs. This is a cousin to the Amplatzer atrial septal device well, the technique uh, is frequently supplemented with echocardiographic guidance, and we'll show you why we like to use echo to help us uh, implant these devices. And it is, in many centers, uh, used with transesophageal echocardiogram, but the TEE probe being down the patient during the procedure can be somewhat uncomfortable. So, uh, Many centers, if they do this procedure, will intubate the patient and put them under general anesthesia to make it less uncomfortable for the patient during the procedure. At our institution, we've been using intracardiac echo, uh, which is placed in the left femoral vein and passed up into the right atrium because this is, uh, le causes less discomfort to the patient. Here's the intracardiac echo images of our patient here. And because we're in the uh, right atrium, you can see the, uh, uh, to orient ourselves, uh, unlike the TEE, we're now looking at the right atrium up here, the atrial septum here, and the left atrium down there. The PFO can be seen at this location right here. The technique is fairly simple and straightforward. We cross the PFO with a catheter. We place the catheter with a wire, and over the wire, we pass a compliant sizing balloon so that we can measure the stretch diameter of the uh, PFO. And here is a uh, picture of that. Here is our intracardiac echo probe seen under fluoroscopy. And here is our sizing balloon. And on intracardiac echo, we can see the sizing balloon uh, appearance right here across the atrial septum. And what we do is we measure the waist of that balloon and that uh, tells us the uh, dimensions, the stretch dimensions of the uh, defect. And we also measure it by intracardiac echo, which is perhaps a more accurate uh, way of uh, sizing the defect. Now, this is our patient's uh, sizing balloon. And the reason I want to show you this in particular is to show you that there is an elongated waist right here consistent with that tunnel PFO that was seen with our particular patient. And here's how we deploy the device, which is loaded in our catheter uh, that is across the uh, septum in the left atrium. We've deployed the left atrial limb. We pull back across the atrial septum, pull back our catheter a little farther, and deploy the right atrial limbs of the device. And now it is across the uh, septum. We can look at it uh, real time by intracardiac echo, where we uh, can see the device being deployed in the uh, left atrium right here, it is being pulled back snug across the atrial septum, and we ensure that we have a, a good placement across the atrial septum, and then we release the right atrial limb of the device, which uh, comes right there. You can see it uh, being deployed. We have the device is still tethered by our uh, wire, so we, we have a hold of it, and we can pull it back into our catheter if we don't like the placement, but we can see that we have captured the septum on both sides 
uh, of this device, uh, and this is a good placement. Once we uh, are satisfied with the placement, we simply release the device and we go home. The uh, procedure is uh, virtually an outpatient procedure. It uh, doesn't take very long at all, 20 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, the patients are monitored for a few hours afterwards. They're given six months worth of antiplatelet therapy to minimize uh, thrombus development on the device itself. We also ask that if they go to the dentist that they have endocarditis prophylaxis for six months. We believe that it's only necessary for these measures for six months because we have evidence that the uh, body's tissue will incorporate the device after a period of months. For example, here is a, uh, a sheep heart which had a cardioseal device implanted in three months before, and you can see that uh, the device has been well endothelialized and incorporated into the cardiac tissues. So now that we can see that the uh, uh, closure of these PFOs is actually a fairly straightforward and simple procedure. The question is, is it effective and how does it compare with the alternative uh, treatment measures? Uh, here is a series of prospective and retrospective observational studies. Now, ideally what everybody would like to see is a randomized trial comparing this to alternative treatments such as medical therapy. Unfortunately, attempts at performing these randomized trials have been unsuccessful due to the fact that patients uh, have not been willing to be enrolled in the trial. You see, if you have a stroke and you know that you have a congenital defect which potentially will lead to a fu future stroke, it's like a sword of Damocles uh, over your head, or at least that is what uh, patients often describe. And if they recognize that there is a modality to try and close that, then many of the patients are unwilling to consider the alternative of medical therapy. So let me show you what data that we have, which is observational. You can see that there have been an increasing number of observational studies over the last few years, and that the success rate uh, of closing these PFOs has been very, very high, uh, from 97 to 100%. Now, is it effective? Well, the follow-up permanent neurologic uh, event rate, that is a stroke after the device has been placed and the stroke which uh, led, uh, leads to a permanent neurologic deficit, has been nearly zero in all of these studies, uh, less than one in a thousand, uh, or roughly about one in a thousand uh, permanent neurologic events after one of these devices has been placed. There have, however, been transient events such as TIAs that occur in about one to three percent of cases. Why do these occur? Is it because of incomplete closure of the PFO? Is it because of platelet thrombi developing on the device? Or is it because these events are coming from some other etiology? We don't know the answer. In addition, we have to worry about the complications of medical therapy. That is hemorrhage with warfarin, which occurred in about 2% of serious hemorrhage per year, uh, and about 20% of uh, mild uh, hemorrhagic complications. Incidence of hemorrhage with aspirin is uh, also an issue, although was less uh, in the WARS trial compared to Coumadin. I want to discuss uh, briefly the WARS trial. This was a uh, study that was uh, presented um, uh, last year. Uh, WARS stands for Warfarin Aspirin Recurrent Stroke Study. This study took patients who had had an ischemic stroke and randomly assigned them to either warfarin or aspirin and followed them for two years and looked at it a uh, endpoint of either death or recurrent stroke. And over this two-year period of time, the event rates were actually quite high. Now, the PICS study was a sub-study which identified patients in wars who had a patent for amino valley. And so PIC stands for PFO, Encryptogenic Stroke Study. And there were about 200 uh, patients with patent for amino valleys in wars, and their event rates, as can be seen here, over two years was 16.5% of death or permanent neurologic uh, event uh, in the warfarin group and 13.2% in the aspirin group, not statistically significantly different, and very high significant event rates uh, with medical therapy in these patients with PFOs and prior uh, ischemic events treated with either aspirin or warfarin. How about surgical closure? Well, this is something that's been done, but not well documented in the literature. It's probably done a lot more uh, uh, in, uh, in real life, in practice. 
Uh, there's only been a few studies which has actually looked at the outcomes, and you can see that the outcomes have uh, varied a little bit uh, between the different studies. But I'd like to draw your attention to the largest of these trials, which comes from the Mayo Clinic of 91 patients, followed them up for two years after surgical closure of their PFO. They found no permanent neurologic event during this two-year span of time, and about a 4% incidence of transient events, somewhat similar to the percutaneous uh, closure data. There was a, a six-day stay median uh, in this uh, trial, so about a week in the hospital, uh, as opposed to the percutaneous closure, which is an outpatient procedure, uh, and the complication rate, including infections and uh, bleeding and so forth, was not trivial at about 11%. Well, as mentioned, there's no good randomized trial data. I'd like to show you a retrospective study that has been uh, presented by a German group. Uh, this was a retrospective case control study of 150 patients with PFO closure versus 161 matched patients who were treated with medical management, half of them with aspirin, half of them with uh, Coumadin. And they followed them for two and a half years. And you can see that the event rate, including either a TIA or a stroke, was statistically significantly reduced in those patients who were treated with closure. And if we look specifically at the permanent neurologic event rate, it was zero in those treated with closure as opposed to about 4% of those treated medically. And if we look at patients who have had multiple neurologic events, the event uh, reduction is even more striking. Here is a study uh, from another group in Germany looking at patients who had had multiple events, and they calculated that these patients had an event rate of 26% per year uh, in this high-risk population. And after the uh, PFOs were closed, then they found an event rate of only 2.5% per year, so a tenfold reduction in events in this patient population who were high risk for uh, future events. Well, a PFO is a cousin to the atrial septal defect. There are some major differences. A PFO is a failure of fusion of the uh, septum primum and septum secundum. An atrial septal defect is a morphological failure of development uh, in the atrial septum. Nonetheless, we have also uh, recently had available to us uh, te uh, technology to allow us to close these atrial septal defects in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. ASDs lead to cardiovascular problems, whereas PFOs do not. Dr. Tom Jones from Children's Hospital has been very instrumental in helping us develop our program here in uh, closure of congenital cardiac, event, uh, uh, cardiac um, uh, defects, such as ASDs and PFOs. And to discuss briefly uh, percutaneous closure of ASDs, I'd like to invite Dr. Jones to come up. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve. A pleasure to be here. Um, I want to uh, just spend a few minutes talking about uh, what uh, Steve uh, mentioned, uh, the atrial septal defect, which is actually a birth defect of the heart as opposed to the patent foramen ovale we've been uh, reviewing, which uh, can be viewed as a, a, a normal variation in uh, human uh, heart anatomy. And I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes talking about uh, this particular device, uh, which has reached uh, uh, full FDA approval within the last year. This is the Amplatzer atrial septal occluder device. And as Steve uh, demonstrated earlier, it's a device that's composed of a woven mesh of fine nitinol wire. Nitinol is a nickel titanium alloy, which is extremely strong, very light, and has memory for the shape at which it's formed and, and baked in an oven overnight. Sewn within that uh, mesh is a polyester or dacron fabric so what the device is able to do is deliver and hold in place a piece of patch material similar to what a cardiac surgeon would sew directly into the hole during an open heart repair. The device, as you see during its deployment, is extruded through the delivery catheter and reforms into the shape that you see there. Initially, the left atrial disc deploying, followed by the waist, which is uh, fitted snugly within the defect, and then the, finally the right atrial disc. The two discs then hold that uh, waist in place across the defect until healing occurs, as uh, Dr. Goldberg previously demonstrated with that animal image of the uh, cardioseal device. Here is uh, a view uh, during deployment 
of the atrial septal uh, uh, device, and you see initially the left atrial disc uh, blossom within the left atrium. It's drawn back across the inner atrial septum, and then the right atrial disc is deployed. During transesophageal echocardiographic imaging, you see the same deployment occurring as we just viewed uh, fluoroscopically. The left atrial disc is being deployed here. It'll be drawn up and snugged against the atrial septum. And the waste will then be deployed, and then the right atrial disc will appear here momentarily. Now, at this point, the device is still firmly attached to the delivery cable and can be retrieved and repositioned if the deployment is not felt to be satisfactory. Once we're uh, pleased with the position of the device and it appears to be tolerated by the patient, it's simply a matter of unscrewing the device from the delivery cable and it's released in the heart. As uh, Steve mentioned, uh, with PFO closure, this uh, closure process can also be performed on an outpatient basis. It takes anywhere from about one to two hours to complete and the patients are discharged home uh, within uh, the six to, six to eight hours. <clears throat> the, uh, the Children's Hospital here in Seattle uh, was one of the initial uh, uh, study centers for the atrial septal defect clinical trials, which led ultimately to the FDA approval of this device. And in, in this trial, there were 442 patients uh, enrolled uh, that underwent uh, successful closure of their atrial septal defects. The immediate technical su success was high, uh, nearly 96%, and the major complication rate was extremely low. Now, the complications reported were principally cardiac arrhythmias uh, and a few instances of device embolization. Uh, those uh, tended to occur early in an in individual operator's experience. There were no instances of uh, death, cardiac perforation, stroke, or other major complications. By a year of uh, uh, at, at a year of follow-up following device closure, uh, nearly 100% of patients had no evidence of uh, any residual shunt or only a minimal shunt. Now, atrial septal defects occur uh, in about 1 in 1,500 live births, and that translates into about 5,000 cases per year in the United States alone. Uh, in the past, uh, many of these instant individuals would uh, require open-heart surgical correction, and if undiscovered and untreated, uh, the morbidity and ultimately the mortality of atrial septal defects can be quite significant, particularly in adulthood. Uh, the opportunity to close most of these defects by percutaneous means has uh, been a tremendous advancement in our management of this particular congenital heart uh, condition. It can be done in both young children as well as adults, uh, and uh, we have here at the University of Washington closed ASDs and individuals up to as, as old as 76 years with, uh, with good result. So in summary, uh, in the, the last year we have now uh, had uh, devices made available to us uh, to allow us to percutaneously close uh, secundum atrial septal defects as well as patent frame and ovales uh, for patients uh, who are at risk or have developed a cryptogenic stroke. We found that with both of these devices, there is a low risk of complications with uh, implantation and uh, minimal hospitalization, virtually outpatient procedures. Specifically, with regards to the uh, closure of the patent frame of valleys, long-term data certainly needs to be uh, developed uh, to demonstrate uh, efficacy compared to the alternative uh, treatment strategies. Thank you. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for their excellent presentations this morning. And again, I thank the audience for their participation as well. And look forward to seeing all of you at another Grand Rounds for the University of Washington Regional Heart Center. Thank you.